is the best performing asset in the world, <laughs> but no one likes to talk about that, which is, I always find very humorous that it has been long-term, one of the best performing, if not the best performing asset in the marketplace, and nobody talks about it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Real Vision deep dive on the gold market. Is this the end or the beginning of a golden era for the gold price? I'm joined by a couple of great gentlemen to um, answer that question. First of all, uh, Ronnie Stoffele, welcome to the show. Hi, Andreas. And uh, also a warm welcome to you, Frank uh, Dijkstra. Um, a pleasure to see you. My pleasure. Guys, we've seen a pretty weak price action in gold lately, um, meaning that we've received a lot of questions on this platform on whether this is the end of a so-called golden era for the uh, gold price. Uh, I'd like to start with an initial discussion on the drivers of, of the price action that we've seen uh, lately, Ronnie. I'll start with you. Why do you think we've seen a sell-off in the gold price since uh, the spring? <laughs> Well, well, I would say we haven't only seen a weak price action uh, when it comes to gold, but but basically everywhere. I mean, um, it's it's pretty rough out there, and and I don't know. You probably also uh, get up very early and 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 uh, read and talk and think about markets for many many hours these days. It's 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 really crunch time, um, it seems. Um, so so I think when it comes to gold, first of all, we have to say that. Um, Gold held up tremendously well uh, against this huge rise in, in in real interest rates. So if you would have told me like one year ago that, you know, real rates are at plus 2.5% uh, and the gold price would be trading at 1950, I would have told you, no way, it's not going to happen. Gold would have to trade at 1600, something like that. Um, well, it held up pretty, pretty well, and now you know. Uh, last week was 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 really weak, and I think that you know um, it, it was probably kind of some sort of pent up pressure um, from from the recent break higher in the ten year yield and 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 in bond markets in general that was basically released due to the fact that uh, we saw options expire uh, options uh, expiry last week, and and you know we saw some some some. Um, follow-up selling and you know this this happened in a general very very turbulent market let's not forget that um, um, we've seen enormous uh, strength in the US dollar the Dixie was trading at uh, around 100 in mid-July now we're trading at 107 um, and you know what's what's going on in with Western financial investors I think it's uh, it's 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 crystal clear that they couldn't care less about gold at the moment. So we have seen uh, over 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 the last four months, we've seen outflows of 144 tons from European and North American investors, and I think this was kind of compensated and overcompensated by uh, Chinese uh, retail demand, but also <coughs> by um, central bank demand, primarily from Asia. Um, but but now it seems that this is kind of uh, has kind of disappeared uh, over the last couple of days. I'm actually, you know, I'm 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 not too concerned uh, uh, when it comes to gold. I'm more concerned about other pockets of the market. Um, and I think, you know, um, we we shouldn't forget uh, that, you know, just in a couple of months we went from. From hard landing to soft landing, and now it's basically Goldilocks and 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 higher for longer, and and I just buy I don't buy into that. Yeah, I think we're in for a um, really really let's say challenging market uh, over 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 the next couple of days. And just to to sum it up, I, I my take is that you know selling gold be, because you know U.S. Treasury yields have risen so sharply is probably it's it's hundred percent correct in the short term but it's probably wrong in the intermediate and long and long term so um can gold go lower um definitely yeah mid 1700 something like that can definitely happen but i think you know it's it's still a pretty constructive setup frank what do you make of the uh, most recent price action in uh, in golden commodity space anything that has caught your attention 
Well, you know, I agree with almost everything that Ronnie said. I think that uh, uh, we live in unprecedented times and what's happening out there in the general marketplace, gold included and everything else, we've never seen this before. Times are different. Um, and uh, I don't believe this is the end of gold. I believe this is the beginning of gold. Mm. And uh, I, I think with what Ronnie mentioned that, you know, there's the ETFs have, have, have been sellers. Uh, uh, the paper gold market has been very weak. Um, I think since about 2020, uh, ETFs have lost 21% of their holdings. People are bailing on gold, but this is the West. And that's not what's happening in the East. <laughs> in the East, there's a tremendous demand and has been for a while in this accelerating of physical gold. So you can't confuse what we're seeing in the West, which is the price action of paper gold with what's really happening where, you know, where people are buying gold in, in, in the physical form. Um, and I think that uh, the sentiment generally with respect to gold is that we're in this now with this new term, higher for longer. Okay. And I think that term higher for longer is going to go the way of transitory inflation. These are terms that mean nothing. In, 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 in reality, the rates where they are now cannot stay there long. They've stayed there a lot longer than they should have. And I think you're going to see some sort of a financial accident. I see a recession coming. Uh, and I see uh, either a recession or a financial accident or both, which is going to turn all of this sentiment around. And you're going to see people pile back into gold when this charade that the Fed is conducting is over. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. Mm. I think um, I have three major topics that I would like to discuss with uh, with you guys today. Uh, one of them relates to gold flows in the East versus the West. I think that's a very interesting topic. Um, and then I'd also like to discuss gold versus Bitcoin uh, in this uh, era of uh, financial repression and ultimately why gold fits into a broader portfolio. But why don't we start with gold flows across the globe uh, now that you also mentioned the dis description between the flows that we've seen in the East and the West lately, Frank. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Ronnie. I mean, um, it was it was pretty clear that central banks reacted across the globe uh, to the seizing of the um, Russian FX reserve after the invasion. It was like we got a reaction from central banks globally in gold space to this um, turmoil between Russia and the US. So if you look at central banks and their role in this gold market, how important are the central banks and the central banks flows to the gold market? Uh, I think it's pretty interesting, first of all, that that the gold community um, likes to criticize central bankers all the time because they're behind the curve and everything and they're printing too much money. But then on the other hand, we're quite happy that, that central <laughs> banks uh, hold um, big amounts of gold and that they're actually buying huge amounts of gold, uh, especially when it comes to, to Asian markets. Now, now I think that that last year, basically, uh, and this is something that that we called pre pre pretty accurately. Um, I think you know, with the start of the start of the war, um, you know, it's it's something broke, and 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 it's 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 pretty obvious that uh, you know, if if like four hundred uh, billion in 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 Russian reserves are basically wiped out with a with a stroke of a pen, um, you know, that's that's definitely a signal to many many other. Uh, countries that are somewhat uh, critical um, to the United States and 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 don't share their opinions all the time, and that's that's quite a lot of countries actually. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that many countries um, kind of woke up and said, well, perhaps we've got too much too much dollar exposure. Uh, um, you know, we should perhaps diversify out of um, uh, uh, that because we saw that uh, you know it can happen pretty pretty quickly. So last year we saw the the, the highest amounts of um, central bank purchases, um, basically um, since uh, you know I think uh, since the numbers are, are, are recorded. So so at least since the 1950s, 
And first half of the year was also very strong, uh, highest purchases from central banks uh, in the last 20 years. So it is, it is definitely a big trend. Um, and it is not only China and Russia that are quite vocal and quite transparent um, when it comes to, to their central bank purchases. And I think this we shouldn't underestimate the, the symbolic character of that, you know, Chinese announcing every month that they've purchased some gold. Um, but it is also, you know, uh, Arabic markets, um, quite recently also uh, uh, in Europe, Poland uh, and also Hungary, where we're buying gold. Um, Singapore is 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 building up their gold reserves. So it is definitely a big trend. And I think you know, um, I, I've I've posted a, a chart this this week that uh, was was pretty um, yeah went kind of viral. And I said, well, well, actually, if you have a look at the uh, at the numbers, we are seeing more of a de euroization than a de dollarization and i think that you know everybody um, um hates brand johnson for his uh, uh <laughs> view on the strength of the dollar and you know dollar milkshake theory and so on but nobody's really talking about the the role of the euro um in international trade and i think that um uh, the euro is much more threatened um, than than the U.S. dollar at the moment, probably. So, um, I think if you and that's that's pretty a very very long term story. Um, if you want to um, see some you know new world monetary order, let's let's put it that way, some sort of multipolarity, um, you need um, a currency that is neutral. Uh, you need a currency that doesn't have any counterparty risk. You need a currency that is that has very sophisticated, you know, um, um, infrastructure when it comes to trading, when it comes to, you know, all the banks um, settling trades. And you have to have a, a currency that is very liquid. And, you know, gold is traded um, roughly 150 billion per day. So, so I think that in this really big political development that we're seeing, um, we, we we will continue to see quite a lot of demand coming in from 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 central banks, primarily from emerging markets, um, and therefore I think that's that's probably going to be the one of the pillars of this of this bull market in 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 gold. And uh, you referred to that great chart. Uh, shown on, on Twitter and, and elsewhere on, on the euro and not being used as uh, often in swift settlements as earlier. That was quite the development over the past couple of quarters. A very good observation, Ronnie. And I, I share your sentiment on the euro versus the dollar right now. Uh, Frank, I'd like to ask you um, on the divergence between the flow seen in the East and the West uh, in relation to gold markets. You mentioned uh, Chinese and Indian flows, as far as I remember, as being important right now. Mm -hmm. um, so how important are China and India and other uh, Asian uh, countries for the gold markets right now? Yeah, well, China and India have traditionally been half of the gold demand, so mm -hmm. and that continues. But I, I totally agree with what, what Ronnie was saying. I think that uh, the central banks have underpinned the gold price for this past while, while in the West, you know, we've seen all the, you know, the selling out of the ETFs and the hedge funds, the momentum players. Are simply not there at the moment. So, um, and Russia, the Russia war and the sanctions that came with it only served to accelerate a trend that was already in place since 1995. 46,000 tons of physical gold have moved from the West to the East. Since the beginning of this last year, but think of close to 700 tons have physical gold have moved from the west to the east. In, in other words, the New York and uh, London vaults are being emptied and the physical stuff is moving to places like China. I personally believe that China has bigger, much bigger gold holdings than what they've reported. Um, I think that, you know, that 2,100 tons that they've, you know, they, they've reported is way understated. And, and I believe that for a very simple reason, and I believe there's a purpose to this. I believe that, um, First of all, China is the world's largest gold producer, is the world's largest gold importer. It doesn't allow the export of mined gold in China. Um, so you and you start looking at all that gold that's flowed east, a lot of it to China, and you wonder where it's being stashed and what for what purpose. 
I'm one of the few that believe that the world is going to, is going to undertake a reset in the global monetary system and that gold will play a role. And that is the reason that every emerging market in the world right now has been buying gold at an accelerating pace. And you mentioned Singapore, you know, Singapore doubled its gold reserves in a very short period of time. Brazil did the same last year. Um, every month, it's a different player, but they're all the non-Western players. You, you know, all of the, you know, the, 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 the BRICS plus countries and the global South have been loading up on gold. And you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose? And as, as Ronnie mentioned, gold is money. And it's a very li liquid form of money. It's a very neutral form of money. And in a world where I think, you know, uh, we're going to see a very either multipolar world or a bifurcated world in terms of trade, in terms of geopolitics, the world is preparing itself for what is coming next. And I honestly believe that gold will play some role in that. What it looks like, I don't know. It could be a BRICS currency or BRICS plus currency. You know, that might take some time, but, you know, there is definitely an interest in going in that direction. Or it could be the yuan may emerge as a gold-backed currency. You have all of the central bank digital currencies that are being test piloted in about 130 countries. And so, and plus alongside of that, you're seeing all of these, almost every day now you see a bilateral agreement between countries to trade in only their local currencies. So if you just think forward, you know, what could happen, you know, as we, as the world is looking for a monetary reset, you know, perhaps these digital currencies in these bilateral trade agreements will have gold backing, some form of gold backing. Keep in mind, you don't have to have 100% gold backed currencies. You know, you think Great Britain 100 years ago, it only put 20% backing to the British pound when, when we had, you know, when, when mm. currencies were backed by gold. So it's not necessary. You can create some form of structure where it's based on GDP, trade, or, or money supply. I believe that will happen because when you have 80% of the world's population wanting a change, and now, because of the Russian war and because of the tensions between China and the U.S., China is out there advocating for a change. It's courting dance partners, and it's getting them in droves. <laughs> so I believe in due course we're going to see a monetary reset, and I believe gold will play a role. So I, I think we're slowly but surely uh, getting started on the discussion on why having gold in a portfolio, uh, Ronnie. Um, if we look at um, the probability of a monetary reset, for example, uh, it is obviously one of the questions you have to um, to address when you set up a portfolio uh, as an investor or as a pension fund. Um, so if you look at the probability of such a monetary reset or um, the risk of a, a reshuffling of the financial system globally, in that context, what are the pros and cons of introducing gold as a hedge against that in the portfolio? Uh, it's a great question, and um, you know, just just as a little side note, Andreas, it's you know we're probably known a little bit for our in gold we trust report, um, but but primarily we're asset managers, and mm. um, I, I I I did presentations about talking about gold in in roughly thirty five countries and. The best questions were always asked um, in high inflation countries. Yeah, for example, you know, I, I had a, 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 a keynote with very sophisticated investors in in Istanbul, mm. uh, and Turkish people know everything about gold. You know, they were asking like the best questions ever. Why? Because they're used to you know inflation being one of the primary concerns, mm. and you know one of the first things to uh, think about when you structure a portfolio and and if 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 my take is correct that you know this great moderation has ended you know this basically 40 years of very very low inflation volatility and inflation inflation will continue to be a uh, a topic while at the moment, it seems that deflationary pressures are are are, are pretty significant. However, I, I I think that you know inflation will continue to be um, uh, significantly higher than in the previous regime. So so I think that when it comes to portfolio construction, that 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 gold will kind of 
move from a very much of a satellite investment more to the core of 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 uh, structuring your portfolio. Now, I think what's what's very very important, Andreas, is um, gold is an extremely emotional topic. Um, everybody has an opinion on gold, and it's not you know there's nothing in between. You're either extremely against gold or you're a diehard gold bug. Yeah, and I hate that ter- term gold bug, but but I think you know when it comes to I don't know convertible bonds. Uh, nobody, you know, people couldn't care less about it. But but everybody has some sort of a or, or thinks that he has to have an opinion on gold, and and that's probably because you know it's 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 also something you know that uh, that that people share stories about. You know, when when I talk to my grandparents, you know, they've lost everything uh, during the war, uh, during uh, monetary reforms uh, uh, due to hyperinflation. And for them, gold is just natural. You know, our wedding rings are are golden. It's, it is something very special. However, as an asset manager, I really want to take out this, this emotional aspect. So I think it's important to say that, first of all, gold is not uh you know the solution to all our problems it's it's not the 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 the, the answer to all our questions um in german we say the the eierlegende wollmilchsau which is the the egg laying um woolly pig basically but i think that gold has really uh, unique portfolio characteristics so so it works as a portfolio diversifier it's got a um Basically, a very very low correlation uh, with other asset classes. It's it's a pretty good um, hedge um, for for tail risk events. It's it's a good equity hedge. Actually, uh, uh, we crunched the numbers on that, and 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 for the last ten major market corrections, uh, while the S and P was down uh, more than thirty percent, gold was up by nineteen percent. Gold is extremely liquid, as I as I've mentioned before. Yeah, it's 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 got a very very uh, low bid ask spread. So it is something that you can actually um, you know uh, also sell in stress situations uh, uh, quite conveniently, and it's a very good currency hedge. And lastly, and I think we will probably uh, talk about that later on. Gold works pretty well as a recession hedge. So um, I think that gold. And we can talk about the the percentage of gold in your portfolio, um, but I think it's like it's a very very solid and reliable defender or a, a goalkeeper like the I don't know uh, Gianluigi Buffon or or uh, uh, what, what's the Danish uh, goalkeeper Peter Schmeichel. <laughs> um, so so that's the role of gold, but it's not there to you know um, uh, score the goals. So so I think. Gold's role over the long term is protecting your purchasing power. That's really what gold is about. It's not there to make you rich. And and we put out two two special papers recently showing the the, the purchasing power of gold at the Munich Oktoberfest since 1950. <laughs> and also we did the same one for the younger crowd, uh, the purchasing power of gold measured in iPhones. Um, and of course, it's not 100% stable, but over the long term, gold does a really, really good job of hedging um, you against, portfo- uh, against uh, uh, inflation and really protecting and saving your purchasing power. Makes a lot of sense, Rani, and it's a good point um, to to highlight the purchasing power um, story here in gold terms. Um, I'd like both uh, of you, your, your take on sizing of gold uh, in a portfolio. Uh, we'll start with you, Frank. Uh, I, I'm a very simple guy. If I have, say, a 10% probability uh, in my base case for a monetary reset, I'd like at least 10% of gold or something yeah. similar in my portfolio to hedge yeah. against that. So how do you view this this question of sizing uh, gold positions in, in, in yeah. a portfolio setting? Yeah, first I want to comment on what Ronnie said. He's absolutely yeah. right. If you, you know, we always, you know, in the West, we look at the world through the lens of either the U.S. or Europe. And I think if you look at then a, cases like Argentina and Egypt, and you see what happens to the gold price in, in their local currency terms, you look at Turkey, gold has gone up five times in the last three, it's, it's gone up fivefold in the last three years. Argentina has gone up tenfold in the last three years. 
Japan, which is now experiencing some of their own problems caused by monetary policy, it's up 50 percent in this last year. Okay, so and you know, and we talk about the you know the the what what is what becomes part of culture, and as in Germany, I lived in Argentina as a little boy. My father lost everything to hyperinflation in Argentina. Everything, you know, by the time he got his money out of the country, hyperinflation had set in, and it worth when he got his money, it was worth absolutely zero. And I think that we we in the West forget that these sort of things can happen. And, you know, we have this attitude that it can never happen here, um, you know, because of American exceptionalism, which I think will go, that term is going to go the way of the uh, riches in Argentine, which was a term that was used up to, until the 1950s, if you all remember. Um, as far as portfolio management, I, I, I'm not a portfolio manager like Ronnie, you know, but I've been an investor for 45 years. I, you know, I watch markets very carefully. And I, I remember living in Zurich in, uh, for three years in the 1980s. And I remember at that time, it was absolutely standard uh, procedure to have 10% of your portfolio in gold. That was just the way it was done. Um, and that just was because gold is a hedge against stupidity. It's like it's a it's a hedge against everything. <laughs> so you need to have gold as a diversifier in your portfolio. Furthermore, I think in the world that we're living in today, the 60-40 stock bond portfolio formula is dead. And we've seen that over the last while. You can have both stocks and bonds imploding. So, and I think that that I that concept that's that method it. It's going to be very hard for portfolio managers, especially in pension funds and large mutual funds, to or uh, you know uh, foundation funds, whatever endowment funds, because I sat on the board on a few of them and I know how they think, and they're not going to. They just don't want to let go of that, regardless of what is happening right in front of their eyes. So I honestly believe that, uh, and gold has actually done very well long term. You don't buy gold to look at it day to day. That is absolutely stupid. You buy gold as a store of value. You want to get rich? Buy mining stocks. Take more risk. Yeah, you can possibly get rich. That, but that's not the purpose of physical gold. It's to sit in your portfolio as a hedge. And if you look at the long-term performance of gold from 1971 to present, or even from 2001 to present, is the best performing asset in the world. <laughs> but no one likes to talk about that, which is I always find very humorous that it has been long term one of the best performing if not the best performing asset in the marketplace and nobody talks about it mm. ronnie your view on the sizing uh, of a gold position seen from an asset management perspective well i think there's no no magic number um i just think that every time when you know, bankers come out and say, well, our private banking department suggests a 1.5% allocation to gold. I think, you know, it, it doesn't really move the needle. Um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, if, if you're buying it as a, as a hedge, 1.5%, uh, you know, with the volatility of gold is, is not enough. I would say something between 8 to 15% uh, for physical gold is something that, uh, that works pretty well. We we crunch the numbers on that, and you know, just from a shop ratio point of view, it 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 really really makes a difference, uh, and it smoothens your volatility even in you know let's say normal circumstances to add gold to to your portfolio. Um, it is something that you know in the let's say the 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 Austrian world and the the, the hard money community. Um, Portfolios are, are 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 very very much skewed, you know, um, gold, gold miners, silver, silver miners, uh, and in and in times like like these, um, that's you know you 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 got a tough time really, um, uh, you know, surviving that volatility that we're seeing. Um, so I would say eight to fifteen percent as a rule of thumb but of course it depends on the rest of your portfolio it depends on your age when you're your young kid of course you want to have more more equity uh, uh, allocation and so on so um, but that's that would be like my my general uh, recommendation 
Frank, if um, if we look at gold in a portfolio context, you can obviously express a positive view on gold long term via both a physical position, via a paper position, via a position in miners. Um, so how how do you view this question on how to express a position in gold in, in portfolio terms? What do you prefer to do? Well, listen, everybody has a different risk profile. And yeah. you know, for me to give a recommendation of how you allocate gold mm. and Gold stocks and paper. Listen, I'll tell you what I do, but you know, I, I you know, I have a different, uh, you know, level of wealth than than, than some people. Um, so, but I'm very heavily in, uh, invested in physical gold. Um, um, that those numbers that Ronnie was throwing around make a lot of sense to me for physical gold. Um, if I want to trade gold just on action, I'll, I'll trade the gold ETFs, but I would never own them long term. As a store of value, and then because I have been a mining financier my entire life, obviously <laughs> I'm invested in mining stocks. But listen, I the way I do it, like I'm, I'm I'm the guy that creates gold mining companies. I've created quite a few of them over the years, some very large, and you know obviously I have a, an expertise in that. So I I'm going to be way more heavily weighted in gold than most people. Um, mm -hmm. But it's my physical gold. When I think about my physical gold, as opposed to owning gold mining stocks or you know having a few gold ETFs out there, that's what allows me to sleep at night. I think no matter what happens, you know, I, you know, I could, the markets could go sideways, all sorts of things could happen. Uh, but that physical gold is a long-term store of value, and that's the part that I think people, regardless of your socioeconomic status have, in my opinion, 10% of your wealth in physical gold. Ronnie, um, before we went on air, we, we briefly touched upon uh, miners and the potential marketing issues that they're faced with, um, gold miners, in, um, in the context of this story of, of, of gold performance. So how do you view the miners' story versus the actual commodity here? And, and what are your thoughts uh, on it from an asset management perspective? Well, you know, we, first of all, I, I would say that, um, you know, when people ask me, um, should should I buy physical gold or should I buy mining stocks? And I say that's like, you know, it's com two completely different risk profiles. Yeah, and 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 you just you just cannot compare it. And you know, with physical gold, I mean, what you want to have is as little counterparty risk as possible. Uh, I remember when I was uh, still still an analyst in a bank in 2008, and you know, people called me up and said, "Yeah, the world is going uh, uh, to uh, the world is going down. You know, it's the end of our financial uh, system." I want to buy a, a certificate by HSBC, um, which is a three times leveled uh, certificate on on gold. I say, well, actually, you know. I'm not so sure if 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 you want to have that uh, amount of counterparty risk for the scenarios that that you're obviously seeing. So I think you know if you want to really have a like a, a crisis hedge, um, um, let's say insurance gold, then you want to have physical gold. Yeah. Um, just just one thing that I'm experiencing now from many many clients and discussions that I have with investors: the topic of geographical diversification. Uh, is becoming bigger and bigger. So, so back in the days, you know, their uh, clients had their physical gold with UBS in Zurich. Uh, now, you know, they are talking about New Zealand, uh, Dubai, um, Australia, the US, uh, whatever. So, so that that's just a sign that um, people have kind of lost confidence in. Um, You know, institutions uh, in, in 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 countries also to some degree. So this is really a big trend that I'm seeing. Um, when it comes to miners, um, you know, Frank and I we we met up in 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 Beaver Creek at the Precious Metal Summit, uh, and you know, back then it was like um, three weeks ago. Um, the general mood was already quite quite somber, I would say. Um, it has gotten even worse, and And I think over the last couple of years, if you compare, you know, 
the development of gold to the development of mining stocks, there's quite a lot of disappointment and 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 companies, you know, um, there's obviously uh, political risk, uh, inflation risk, uh, poor management. So so uh, I'm I'm not super happy with the performance of the mining sector in general. Um, however, we shouldn't forget that you know. Um, Gold was trading um, at 250 in 2001, and 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 uh, in 2011 it went up to more than 1900. Uh, and during that time, um, you know, um, the 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 HUY, the gold box index, rose from 35 to 640, I think, uh, at the peak in September 2011. So so 17x. So mining stocks can deliver. Uh, uh, leverage, um, you know, from the conversation that I have with mining stocks, uh, with mining mining operators, um, we are clearly seeing, you know, there, especially the junior side of the market is 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 really experiencing this lack of liquidity. I think they're one of the very first ones to to really um, suffer from. Um, you know, um, uh, risk aversion, but also capital costs uh, rising significantly. So, mm-hmm. so there's really in the junior and in the development space. Um, you know, we're we're probably going to see some blood on the streets. When it comes to the producers, I would say they've most of them have done a really good job, and they've got pristine balance sheets. Um, uh, I think some of them could even be called a, a, a value play. Um, and I don't know. I think it was Ross Beatty who who actually said at the at, at the Denver Gold Conference he's he's feeling like um, a little kid in the candy store, um, uh, referring to to Warren Buffett's uh, quote, what he was saying uh, during the big um, equity bear market. Um, but actually, <laughs> uh, Buffett is misquoted. He actually said back then um, that he feels like a young boy in the whorehouse. <laughs> that's that's the original <laughs> comment by Warren Buffett back then. So pardon my language. <laughs> so so I think it's a it's a pretty pretty good setup in many mining stocks. I think the 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 sentiment probably cannot be any worse. But and this is a topic that I also discussed with uh, uh, with Frank and 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 Rob McEwen in Beaver Creek. I think the sector really has a marketing problem. Um, first of all, um, due to um, the fact that many people regard gold as something useless, um, um, you know, not necessary. While copper, lithium, cobalt, whatever are are needed. Um, and they've got a much more positive um, 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 acceptance in, in in markets. Even uranium, you know, we've seen a big uh, big turnaround. We are running one uranium fund, and and we almost had to close it down. Uh, and now, you know, people are, are, are rediscovering uranium. So so the narrative can change. But at the moment, many, especially institutional players, say, well, gold is kind of useless. We prefer copper. Um, the battery metals, the strategic metals, um, uh, etc. And then the second thing is, 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 is I think that um, where really the the um, the market is now seeing um, many companies, let's say, kind of lifestyle companies that have really made a, a poor um, poor job of allocating ca- capital. I think. Um, and that's the that's the beauty of a bear market. I think many of those companies will be wiped out, but for the for the for the good ones, for the well managed companies with with good people, good projects, solid financing, I think it's a it's 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 a terrific setup. Frank, you're obviously a uh, subject matter expert uh, on on this topic, so I'd like to pick your brain on um, the. Uh, Question brought forward by by Ronnie yeah. here on whether the um, miners have a marketing problem. Do you th- do you share that view? Yeah, no, I do. I do share that yeah. view. I think it's uh, in many ways unfounded. Um, and and you know, and Ronnie's absolutely right. And the way that uh, gold mining is viewed by a lot of the set, uh, a lot of the world. Um, you know, I mean, let me talk about sentiment for a moment because I think that's the part that people tend to get stuck on a current point of view okay i've been doing this for 45 years um i've seen bull markets bear markets i've seen 
long periods of quiet time. I've seen it all. I've seen when capital completely disappears from the sector. I see when the situation looks absolutely hopeless and you think it will be like that forever. And every time you feel that way, you're going to be wrong, okay? Because sentiment changes. And what it's going to take um, in, in this scenario, in my opinion, is for gold to eventually break through its old high and stay there, stay at a new level. And I think that that will turn focus back on where the value sits with gold miners. And Ronnie's absolutely right. Some of the companies, when you look at their balance sheets, you look at their profit margins, the cash free cash flow they're generating, and you compare those valuations to some of the to the rest of the market, other sectors in the market, especially tech and other things that are seem to you know be very popular. Um, there is incredible value, and it makes me wonder where the hell are the value investors? It seems that most investors today, at least in the West, I can't speak to other parts of the world, but in the West, everybody's a momentum player. The hedge funds are all momentum players. They'll play something if it's moving. If it's dead, they won't touch it. And we haven't seen general investors take a look at the gold sector yet. But if you look closely, and I'm involved I can't mention names because I don't promote uh, stocks and interviews, but you know I'm involved in a number of uh, gold mining companies, and I look at their profit margins, their free cash flow relative to what and the amount of gold they've got on the ground that will be mined over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and you look at their valuation, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I shake my head every morning why the market hasn't woken up to that, but they will when the sentiment changes. It's all about sentiment, and right now. The sentiment in this market is very, very poor, but as always, it will change. Mm. Now, as far as what the miners can do, you know, mining in general has been labeled as a, a as a dirty business, and gold mining, you know, is in that is thrown into that group along with everybody else. You know, I've been mining doing mining finance my entire life, and I tell you, industrialized mining doesn't deserve the rap that it gets. It has done. And with environmentally sound practices, every I mean, everything you can imagine is done to prevent mining from being dirty. Where the where where the idea is weaponized is by certain environmental groups that look at how illegal miners or informal miners work in a number of countries and how they pollute the environment. And that's not how. And I'll give you, Colombia is a perfect example. I've been doing mining business in Colombia for over 30 years. I'm involved in mining companies there. 86% of the gold mined in Colombia is conducted by illegal or informal miners. It's not the industrial miners that are creating the problems. So that is part of the problem. But I think the, the bigger problem when it comes to gold or gold mining stocks in general is that the Western media and Wall Street has always underplayed the value of that sector because it's gold and gold um, is runs contrary to a currency system where you can print as much money as you want and get away with it. Because if we lived in an environment where currencies were fixed to the price of gold or backed gold, you wouldn't have this craziness, the printing of money, you know, just the destruction of currencies, which we're watching right in front of our eyes. And yet Wall Street never says anything about it. Uh, they're only, you know, they're only now acknowledging that there is a de-dollarization taking place. Although they will both warn, in the same breath, they'll both warn about it and be dismissive about it that it will ever happen. And I can give you numerous examples that I've read that you know the narrative war has begun on gold and the idea that uh, or or, or de-dollarization. And you, you can just see, by the way, that the Western media is attacking any concept behind the dollarization or behind the creation of a new currency or what China may or may not be doing with respect to you know, all of this. They're poo-pooing it. And they're, but at the same time, they're warning the market that if it did ever happen, it would be tremendously damaging to the U.S. economy. So I, I think um, coming back to the miners, I think that, again, it's, you know, Look for value. That's what I do. So if you, and you can see it, it's you know these companies report. You look at balance sheets. You look at income statements. It's 
it, it, there's incredible value there. And one of these days it will be discovered. In the meantime, if I were Bill Gates, I'm not, I don't have Bill Gates money, but I would be buying control of so many gold mining companies right now. Uh, I would just buy as much. Yeah, the kid in the candy store. That's what I would be. <laughs> And it's such a great point on on sentiment, Frank. I'm um, actively involved in in trading energy markets on a daily basis, and it's very clear that over the past couple of months, with oil prices being on on the rise, we've seen what I call generalist investors being involved in the trade all of a sudden. Um, and uh, you could imagine something similar happening in in gold, gold space if we suddenly get uh, the price momentum back, also in miners. So a uh, very very good point. Uh, before we move on to the final topic, which is um, a hot potato in many ways, gold versus Bitcoin and digital assets. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question, Ronnie, from uh, one of our viewers. Uh, I think it's an important point to make. We've seen a divergence in prices of gold uh, between Shanghai and London recently. Um, so this is something um, of, of interest to to uh, to the audience as well. Could, could you envisage... Um, uh, this uh, divergence of, of price trends in Shanghai and London uh, leading to an increased flow from the West to the East? That's basically the question from, from one of our viewers here. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a sign. It's, it's, it's one of many signs. It's, it's probably the, the huge demand coming from, 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 from Chinese retail investors is due to the fact that, um, you know, first of all, um, we we always talk about you know recession risks and uh, the the economic setup in the Western world, but I think in China, um, uh, it, it's 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 not too positive what's going on at the moment either. Uh, and I think you know especially when it comes to the real estate markets, which which is obviously um, you know most important for for private investors, um, people have kind of lost confidence, and we've we've seen all those uh, real estate developers uh, close closing down and 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 really really being in 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 a distressed situation. So I think that was one of the reasons um, why so much interest um, came from China. Then on the other hand. Um, probably also due to the weakness uh, of the renminbi. Um, and then I think you know uh, I wouldn't make too much out about it, but 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 in general, um, it seems that the premium of the Shanghai market is still kind of a, a sign that people prefer uh, you know the physical stuff. And 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 at the Shanghai Gold Exchange, we we wrote a big chapter about um, the the infrastructure of 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 of, of Asian markets, uh, particularly uh, Shanghai, and it's a hundred percent physically backed. Gold futures contract, and I think um, especially in times like these, when 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 everything is is kind of um, being questioned, uh, you really want to have a hundred percent gold backed um, uh, a contract. Um, however, um, those premiums have have kind of narrowed over the last couple of, of of days, so I wouldn't make too much out of it. But it is just a sign, I would say, that um, Chinese demand is becoming bigger. It's probably, you know, uh, Frank mentioned the numbers, and this is something that 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 gold investors or people, you know, talking about gold often forget. It's not only this kind of fear trade, but also this this I think Frank Holmes uh, coined the term this love trade, where more than fifty percent of physical gold demand is nowadays coming just from China and India, um, at Turkey, Vietnam. Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia to that. And you can see that actually, you know, two thirds of, of, of gold demand are actually coming from emerging markets nowadays. So I would regard gold also as some sort of a play on, on the growth of emerging markets. Makes a lot of sense, uh, Ronnie. We want to save uh, 10 minutes for the discussion on gold versus Bitcoin. Um, as I said earlier, it is a bit of a hot potato, this topic. Uh, and <laughs> to use your um, uh, wording, Ronnie, um, I think the Bitcoin case is an extremely uh, dividing case in many ways. Uh, also, even compared to the gold case, everyone's got an opinion on Bitcoin as well. And either it's um, uh, basically the cure for everything or else it's it's not worth anything. So, um, Frank, I'll start with you. Um, digital gold, um, Bitcoin versus the actual physical gold. What's your opinion on this? <laughs> 
Uh, I have very strong opinions. Um, mm -hmm. So I did a debate a couple of years ago with Michael Saylor, who is the biggest Bitcoin proponent mm -hmm. out there. And I did it for a reason, because uh, he was out there talking up Bitcoin, which is fine, you know, do whatever you like. But he was suggesting that gold was going to go to zero and Bitcoin was going to take over the entire gold market and go to a million dollars per coin. OK, and that really <laughs> I, I had to shake my head. And, then, and I, I, I challenged him to a debate. He finally agreed. And we, you know, you can find that on YouTube somewhere. There's over two million views on that. Uh, and I went through all the reasons why gold, Bitcoin, is not gold. Okay. Now, obviously, there, there, there are two similarities. The similarities are scarcity. Okay. Gold is scarce. Bitcoin is scarce. You know, arguably more scarce than gold because gold has an inflation rate around one and a half, two percent a year. Um, but here's the thing. And listen, I may, I've always said this. I may be wrong, but if you want my honest opinion as whether Bitcoin is the same as gold as a store of value, I say absolutely not. And I'll give you all my reasons because it's untested in a crisis yet. It's barely a decade and a bit old, okay? It's never been tested during a crisis. It does not behave and has not behaved like gold. They actually behave differently at different times, which is proof that it's not gold. It's something, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't, you know, it behaves contrary to gold. For a long time, it was a momentum play, played by all the big players. And, and I have to give credit to the Bitcoin Maxis. They did an incredible job of marketing the concept of Bitcoin, an incredible job, including buying off members of con Congress with, with, with inflated Bitcoin prices. You know, you got to give them credit. They did it. Okay. Um, but but it's not it's not gold, okay? Gold's been around for five thousand years. Uh, gold, an ounce of gold today will buy you a fine uh, gentleman suit, like a Cuccinelli suit. It'll buy one ounce. will buy. One hundred and fifty years ago, it bought you a nice gentleman suit. Two thousand years ago, it bought you a fine Roman tunic. Okay, it keeps its value. Period. So, what do I fear? Uh, what is my fear about Bitcoin is that in a crisis, and I am one of those that believe that eventually we will have a dollar crisis, a fiat currency crisis, because you can't do what they're doing forever. Eventually, gravity will take over and you're going to have a loss of confidence. You're going to have a crisis. Um, if Bitcoin is any type of threat to the U.S. dollar system or perceived to be a threat, they will keel haul it, and it's easy to do. All you have to do is outlaw the ownership of Bitcoin or, or, or control the, um, the amount that you own, and you can shut off the on and off ramps quite easily. It's a digital asset that you can shut it off with a switch of a button if you wanted to. And so if that were to happen in a really extreme scenario, what are you going to do with all that code sitting in your wallet? What good is it going to do? Now, listen, gold, they've tried to confiscate your gold in the past. The U.S. tried to do it in 1933. First, they said, you know, turn in all your gold. And then momentarily after that, they, they repriced gold or devalued the dollar. So they basically screwed over the American people. Um, and in 1971, after all the promises, you know, Nixon closed the gold window and said, no, we're no longer gold back. You can't have our gold. So it was, gold was like smoke. You thought it was there. You went to grab it and it was gone. Okay. so. They may try and confiscate your gold, but they will never try and kill it because they own it. Central banks own a lot of gold and they keep buying it, including the U.S. has a lot of gold. Um, it's not selling it. Okay, so they may try and get your gold, and good luck to them if they try, but they will never try and kill it. Now, Bitcoin, they don't own Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just a competitor a potential competitor in a time of crisis. And you know what happens in times of crisis? You have capital controls. Also, governments will go to great lengths in a crisis to, you know, including screwing over their own people to keep the system intact. So, so that's it. To me, that's it. Now, listen, I may be proven wrong. And if I live 50 years more longer here and 50 years you ask me and I'm wrong, great. But if you're asking me today, where am I going to keep my store of value where I can sleep at night? It's going to be gold. Bitcoin has its purpose and people can speculate whether it will be a gold-like asset someday. And that's fine. And they may be right. 
but it's certainly not proven today, and I wouldn't take the risk as a store value. End of speech. <laughs> um, be Ronnie, before I allow you to respond to uh, to that, uh, um, I, I'd like um, to, to challenge you a little bit, uh, Frank, with with a um, follow up question. Um, let's assume that um, something um, material happens to the view on Bitcoin within central banks. Um, let's assume that there is a growing probability that central banks will actually accept Bitcoin as part of their reserve or accept the possibility that Bitcoin could become part of some sort of digitally backed currency. What would be your, would that be a game changer for your view? That's basically well, my question. Well, of course. But yeah. you're, again, you're speculating. If my aunt yeah. had a beard, she'd be my uncle. You know, it's 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 <laughs> like you're speculating. If, if, if. And that's what, you know, you know, guys like Michael Saylor were running around and saying, well, you know, look, El Salvador and, and, and uh, Central African Republic, you know, are, I said, so what? By the way, it's been a, an absolute disaster in El Salvador as, as a, you know, the whole Bitcoin, Bitcoin experiment. Sure, if tomorrow, um, you know, China, the Central Bank of China or, you know, any other large country decided to load up on Bitcoin, of course it would change my view, but it, it's not happening. I don't see it happening. And so until it happens, you can't ask me questions like that because it's speculation. Yep. Fair point, Frank. Uh, Ronnie, I'll allow you to conclude on uh, on this topic. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, discussions on this exact topic of Bitcoin versus gold with uh, institutions and, and clients of yours. Yeah, well... Well, Andreas, I mean, I I bought my first bitcoins in, in in 2012, and and in hindsight, I you know I I sold too early. Uh, that's that's at least what my my wife keeps telling me. Um, <laughs> but I think you know it's uh, what I really like about it is that 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 people are discussing money again, uh, and I see you know if <laughs> first of all if you go to bitcoin conferences. Um, it's it's crazy, yeah. You meet so many, you know, uh, uh, people from from all over the globe with a very very positive uh, attitude, and it's 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 a very very positive sentiment, and and that's that's what I kind of enjoy, uh, especially compared to 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 gold and mining conferences where it's it's sometimes a bit you know a bit depressing. Um, so, but the fact that young kids are now questioning. Um, themselves and 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 asking the question: What is money? Where does money come from? What is good money? Um, I think that's a very very positive thing because you know it's not money is not being taught you know in school on on universities and and I would say like ninety nine percent of all people working in the bank have got no clue how money is actually being created. So that's a positive thing. Um, the second thing is. Um, you know, we we run uh, two funds that actually combine gold and Bitcoin. One of them is 75% physical gold stored in Liechtenstein um, uh, and 25% Bitcoin in a cold wallet. And then we use the volatility of the Bitcoin market um, uh, by writing options, which is from my point of view that, that that totally makes sense. But we faced lots of criticism from the gold community saying, you know, Bitcoin is, is 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 our arch enemy, but then also from the crypto uh, community because they said, well, gold is you know that's that's only for 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 old people and it's 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 the past but not the future. From my point of view, it's 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 a good combination, and of course, I mean, uh, gold has this tremendous five thousand years track record, while while Bitcoin is hardly a teenager. I mean, it's uh, it's 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 around for fifteen years, and we all know from from our teenage times that. We do crazy, crazy, crazy things during that time, but we grow up, and I think that that Bitcoin has also grown up, and and we are seeing, for example, when it comes to volatility, um, uh, the the 360 day uh, volatility of Bitcoin was uh, 38 percent, um, which is the lowest uh, volatility on record. Uh, gold's volatility, by the way, is roughly 13 percent. So it is definitely it, it's a volatile beast, um, but it is also something that I think tries to, you know, copy gold. And 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 I think Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever it was, he clearly understood gold. And for example, in the white paper, it says um, the steady addition of a constant amount of new coins is analogous to gold miners expanding resources 
to add gold to circulation. In our case, it is CPU time and electricity that is expended. So the stock to flow ratio is really crucial when it comes to understanding gold and when it comes to understanding Bitcoin. And and I think, you know, this, this um, relative scarcity of gold and Bitcoin, this... Um, uh, you know, this this low inflation rate, this is really something that you want to have in this world that we're living in, in this, in this monetary system. So I would say, um, you know, buying Bitcoin, but also buying gold, it, it's like a very active decision to leave the fiat money system. And I've got it for many people that have never bought um, uh, gold, but also Bitcoin. Before, for them, it's like ah, they, they feel like it, it's something, you know, it's like having sex for the very first time. You know, they, they try to read everything and, you know, inform themselves and they're really nervous. But it is, I think, once you got it, once you understand how our monetary system works, I think gold, you know, for stability, but probably Bitcoin for convexity um, uh, makes sense. But I know that uh, it's a it's a very very emotional topic, but you know let's face it we're you know free market guys and I think you know um, we all enjoy the virtues of, of 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 competition and why shouldn't we have like currency competition? Uh, I think that's 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 what Hayek basically said. So so I really welcome um, the fact that that Bitcoin is here and and um, I would say that you know I I I I once made that comparison in an interview with um, uh, Daniela Camboni, I said it's, it's like gold is like having this super stable Volvo SUV in your um, in your garage while Bitcoin is like a, a motorcycle, a Ducati Panengale and um, you can have both actually, yeah, why not? Um, when it's probably a bit icy when it's raining when it's foggy you want to sit in the volvo suv um but it's probably more fun to to ride the ducati so um i'm in the camp that says well why not have both ronnie to uh, to be brutally honest i think my losing my bitcoin virginity was a better experience than losing my actual virginity i guess that says a lot about <laughs> the latter right <laughs> um, uh, guys it's been a tremendous pleasure hosting you for this discussion on gold markets and also the discussion on gold versus uh, bitcoin uh, ronnie stofel of uh, incrementum asset management thank you very much for being with us and also frank just the you. president of the fiori group thank you very much for being with us on our platform it was a pleasure hosting you Thank you, Andreas, thank you. and thank you, Frank. All the best. Thank you. And to all of you watching out there, thank you very much for being with us for this hour uh, with a deep dive into the gold market. We'll be back with more soon on the Real Vision platform. My name is Andreas Steno. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.